How many of you leave the closed caption on at your house? Yeah, yeah. Yep. So imagine if, and I saw this uh, this morning, and I thought, well, that's really appropriate to what I'm talking about, so I thought I'd use it as an illustration. Imagine if you could take whatever problem is happening in your life today, and you could put it in this bucket, bucket of problems. You know, lack of sleep because I stayed up with the youth all night. Enjoy your nap during my sermon. Um, but imagine you could put it in here, and then, but you have to pick somebody else's out. And so let me just do a random. Death of a child. Cancer. By the way, some of you are dealing with some of these things. Divorce. Blank. It's like go to jail, go directly to jail. I don't know. A sick, disabled family member. Bankruptcy. That's the easiest of all those, I think. So, so here's the truth. All of you have something in the trouble bucket. But the truth is, if you could trade with somebody, you might not want to. Right? Right? And whatever you're going through, even right now or whatever you've gone through, has the possibility to either make you bitter or better. And so that's what we're going to talk about today, this idea of when everything goes wrong. We're getting to the end of 1 Samuel. So if you have missed this series and this is your first weekend, it's usually not this depressing. But... Life's just hard sometimes, and we all have those moments, those months, even those years of difficulty, and some we wouldn't want to trade with other people for. And yet some of you think, I, I think I've got the worst thing going on, and, but here's the thing, God cares no matter how small or how big your trouble is. When I was in college, I, uh, first year I went to Miami-Dade Community College, and uh, uh, but then my second year, I went away to Palm Beach Atlantic College, which is now Palm Beach Atlantic University, and I loved being away at school. I just had the best time, and uh, uh, my whole college experience, just, just wonderful Palm Beach Atlantic, great school, and go sailfish. Ellen's right there. All right, so um, go fish, and we had great cheers, and we invented them because the school wasn't that old. And we pretend we invented them. We're not sure. But uh, they still say go fish, which I'm pretty sure we made up. But um, anyway, so, you know, I was at school. I loved it. Had a great time. I was uh, elected chaplain for the first year I was there, which was kind of cool. And got to be a part of that and, and just enjoyed uh, being a part of college. Well, I decided to take a summer class. I was taking a summer class and I had gone home to visit. And all I can say is that my dad was acting different. I, didn't, I don't know how to explain it, even in hindsight as an adult. Uh, maybe he was struggling with uh, depression or uh, definitely struggling with depression, but maybe struggling with schizophrenia. We're not sure. And uh, one night I was home. There was not very many people in the dorms. I'd gone back to school just to take exams. And about two in the morning, three in the morning, somebody came knocking on my door, which was really rare, woke me up out of a dead sleep. And I went into the hallway where the payphone was, and I picked up the phone, and it was my brother, and he said, Dad is dead. Now, I don't know if you've had those moments in life where everything changes, but for us, that was the moment where suddenly everything changed. My dad took his life when I was a sophomore in college, and everything suddenly changed. And I had a choice whether I just stopped going forward and just stopped where I was at and didn't progress anymore or decided to be bitter that life had handed me this difficulty or I could say, God, what do you want me to do? And today when we look at David and we look at the end of 1 Samuel, that's really what was going on with David. We, we look back understanding that David was told, you're going to be king and yet, between the time he was told he was going to be king, he gets spears thrown at him. He's running away. He, he, there are people, a whole armies. There's, there's a bounty on his head. Jabba the Hutt, 
named Saul has put a bounty on his head, and here he is running away. He leaves his best friend, and he's running away, and here he is with about a, a, a whole group of guys who's supporting him and with him, and yet things don't always go well. So today we're going to talk about how to respond when things go wrong. Let me just ask real quick just to see if I'm alone in this. How many of you have had many things go wrong? Would you just raise your hand? You've had things go wrong. How many of you, life is going exactly like you thought it would? Exactly like you. Where's Brian? He would raise his hand because he's a liar. Oh, there he is in the back. Thanks, Brian. All right. So today we're going to talk about how to become better instead of bitter, regardless of what you're going through, regardless of what you're dealing with. And let me just tell you something. Just let me get ahead on this, okay? What's going to happen to David is not fair. And what happens to you and what happens to me oftentimes is not fair. And here's a big secret that some of you don't realize yet. You ready? This is not fair heaven. So things are not fair and things are not always easy. And that's the reason I'm not a TV preacher, because I'm not pretending that if you love Jesus, everything just goes well and the Smurfs show up and they start singing, la, 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 la. Even that would be a nightmare for me, by the way. <laughs> the very things that hurt you, God can use not only to help you, but to lead you to greater places and that you can be a blessing to others. So that's what we're going to look at today. We're going to get right to the message here in ending up our series. This is really the last week of our series. We're going to go into the beginning of 2 Samuel, but we're not pursuing 2 Samuel like we did 1 Samuel, but you'll have to read it on your own. Number one, when the people you love suffer. You ever have somebody that you care about go through a hard time, struggle, struggle with sickness, struggle with cancer, maybe hurting in some way? You see injustice, maybe they're sick, maybe they can't seem to get over it. Let's pick up the story here. 1 Samuel 30, 3 through 5, and I, I did a little different thing with the verses today. You'll get to see it, but um, hopefully it'll make sense when I'm done. When David and his men reached Ziklag, which is just fun to say, they found it destroyed by fire and their wives, sons, and daughters taken captive. Now listen to what it says next. So David and his men wept aloud until they had no strength left to weep. If you have not had those moments yet where you just can't, you, you, you can't cry anymore. These men were so distraught, they couldn't even cry anymore. And then it says, David's two wives had been captured, Ahonazam and of Jezreel, gosh, I pronounced that totally wrong, and Abigail, the widow of Nabal, remember we talked about Nabal the idiot last week, of Carmel. Now, I told Kristen something last year. Last year, I had, uh, I think, six to eight hours. It was six hours of surgery, but they roll you back. And, and then you're there, and Kristen was in the waiting room waiting for the surgeon to come out and tell her what happened. And I told her, even before the surgery, because I've had plenty of surgeries just for fun, I go in just to have surgeries. It's like, you know. So, so here's the thing, and I'm going to teach you about surgery real quick. If you are the patient who is about to have be surgerized, surged, you're preparing for the surge. Dave, listen up. When you go in, a nurse at some point is going to walk up to you and say, how you feeling? Or they might say, are you feeling nervous? Your answer should be yes, every time. I don't care if somewhere in the back of your mind you're thinking, I'm not very nervous. No, no, you're nervous because that's when they go, okay, give me just a minute. I'll be right back with something to help. How, how much, Justin, am I doing good? I'm right on. Okay, so 
So, and by the way, they have to ask you that so the insurance will pay for it. Uh, anyway, so did I say that out loud? I meant to keep that part inside. So, so the next thing you know, they're rolling you somewhere and you don't care. And then somebody comes with something they gave Michael Jackson and it's true. That's absolutely true. Really. It really is. I remember saying in one of the surgeries, isn't that the same stuff they gave to my... And the next thing you know, you wake up. You've been in surgery for six hours. You've been gone for eight hours. But you, as far as you know, had 45 minutes of whatever, and you have no idea. The next thing you know, somebody's in your face going, Hello, Mr. Brookins. Hopefully to you, they're not saying Mr. Brookins. But for my wife, she's been waiting this whole time. Listen, you need to understand that oftentimes it is harder on you than the person you're worried about that's walking through something. And so it's okay to understand that, yes, that person might be hurting and they're going through it, but you also might be. Don't lessen that is what I'm saying. Don't pretend somehow that's not a big deal. David's men were suffering, even though it really was their wives and families who were suffering. They were still suffering. So if you're dealing with somebody who's hurting, don't lessen the fact that, well, at least I'm not them. I get it. I understand that. And there's something in us that sometimes says, what am I complaining about? But the truth is, you're suffering with them. You're struggling with them. So what do you do? What do you do when you're waiting for God to do something? What do you do when you're trying to decide and you're dealing with something difficult and you see somebody that you love suffering? Do what David did. Listen to what it says. A few verses later, David inquired of the Lord, Should I pursue this raiding party? Will I overtake them? In talking to God, God says, Pursue them. You will certainly overtake them and succeed in the rescue. And then a few verses later, David recovered everything the Amalekites had taken, including his two wives. They keep saying that. I love that. Nothing was missing, young or old, boy or girl, plunder or anything else they had taken. David brought everything back and took all the flocks and herd. His men drove them ahead of the other livestock saying, this is David's plunder. So what did David do? David said, God... What do you want me to do? Now, if God had said to him, sit still, I believe David would have sat still. But what did David do? David asked God. Now, sometimes we think, yeah, but Eric, what I'm dealing with isn't that big of a deal. Jesus' first miracle, if you go to John chapter 2 and you look up Jesus' first miracle, you, you, you know what Jesus' first miracle was? This was the huge crisis of the moment. They ran out of wine at a party where a lot of people were already drunk. And Mary says, go see Jesus. Now, the reason I think Mary said this is one night they were at dinner. And Mary looks over and goes, Jesus, what is that you're drinking? He goes, oh, I just made this. But I just poured you water. I know. Here, you can have it. Right? So she, he had done this before. So Mary says, do whatever he tells you. And they go, and he basically creates like tons of wine for a wedding. This was the crisis of the day. Now, why am I telling you that story? Because sometimes we think God doesn't care about my problem. Because my bucket problem is nothing like those you pulled out, Eric. My, my problem's a little... I'm dealing with this person that's difficult. I'm dealing with this struggle in my life. I'm dealing with this challenge. I'm dealing with something that seems small. He cares even about the small problems. So don't hesitate going to God and saying, God, what do I do? God, would you show me what to do? And the Bible says that we can pray for wisdom, which is good. Your pastor has to do that a lot. Lord, give me wisdom. So I want to encourage you, when you're dealing with a difficulty, when someone you love is suffering, it's okay to mourn. You can mourn for them. You can mourn while they're hurting. You can mourn about them. But don't stop there. Seek God for next steps. God, what do I do next? What do you want me to do? Sometimes that's waiting. 
Sometimes it's being still, and sometimes it's taking action. Maybe somebody that you love is hurting, and you, wow, maybe I should make them a meal. Maybe I should give them a delivery service card. Because I've cooked for people before, and their situation's worse afterwards, right? Maybe I should give them some Grubhub, right? Whatever it is, seek God and then follow through with what God wants you to do. Because He hasn't put that on your heart for you to ignore it. He's put those people on your heart for you to do something about it. It could just be that you're supposed to write them a note or send them a text. Somebody just this morning, just a few minutes ago, said, Did you know so-and-so got in an accident yesterday? I said, No. I've already sent that person a text and said, hey, I heard you're banged up. I hope you're okay. I'm praying for you. Is there anything I can do? It took me four seconds. We need to let people know we care, that we're praying for them, that we're there. Number two, when friends turn on you. When I look at the story of Joseph, I realize that even people who do what's right have other people who they thought were their friends or their family turn on them. Now, sometimes people turn on us just because of us, right? There's times that we've done something wrong. We all know those situations. But the truth is, even if you did everything right, some of you are in fights with family members. Some of you had people that you called friends, and one day they turned on you and turned against you. But just like Joseph said to his brothers, what you meant for evil, God meant for good. One of the things I will tell you is that God will often use donkeys in your life to get you to where he wants you. Remember Jesus sat on a donkey and went into town? Sometimes those friends of yours that you thought were the best people in the world, you find out they're donkeys. But if you pay attention, God may even use what somebody else meant for evil for good in your life. Now don't look at your spouse. I saw that. You're my donkey. Okay, don't say that. That's not nice. 1 Samuel 30, verse 6. This is in between what happened. Listen to this. David was greatly distressed because the men were talking of stoning him. Each one was bitter in spirit because of his sons and daughters, but David found strength in the Lord his God. Think of all that David had done. David's running from Saul. David has protected these men. David has raised up basically a small army. He fought with many of these when he was working for the king. And these very men who were supposed to be his best friends, the people who were protecting him, were saying, let's kill him. Now, I don't know how bad your friends have been, but most of them haven't gone that far. Well, I hope. If you have those kind of friends, get new friends. But the truth is, here are the people that were closest to David, and they said, let's kill him. If you're dealing or you've dealt with a situation in your life where people have turned on you, know that you're not alone. Jesus' own disciples turned on him. David's own men turned on him, and your friends will sometimes turn on you. Now, in the New Testament, the same thing happens to Barnabas and Paul. They go into a city. The people think they're so great that they look at Barnabas and they say, Barnabas, you remind us of Zeus and Paul. You're like Hermes. And they try to sacrifice to them. And here's where we pick up Acts 14, 18 to 20. Even with these words, they had difficulty keeping the crowd from sacrificing to them. They're like, we love you. You are the best. By the way, I have read this passage to many pastors. Because I've had pastors call me and say, I thought my congregation loved me and then they fired me. Or I thought this person was my friend and then they attacked me. And this verse, you talk about things changing. This is one sentence. Now listen to the next sentence. Then some Jews came from Antioch and Iconium and won the crowd over. They stoned Paul and dragged him outside the city thinking he was dead. But after the disciples had gathered around him, he got up and went back into the city. This would not have been my choice. The next day, he and Barnabas left for Derby. So in one sentence, they're worshiping Paul and Barnabas. And the next sentence, well, two sentences later, they're, they're, the next sentence, they're attacking him. And the next sentence, they're killing him. Literally killing him. A few sentences later. 
People are often surprised that the same crowd that at the beginning of the week said Hosanna to Jesus, by the end of the week said crucify him. A lot of commentaries have a hard time with that, but I don't. Because these are, you ready? People. And you and I need to understand sometimes that people change and things happen. And if you've been hurt by others, don't let it make you bitter. Let it make you better. You don't have to fully understand it. You don't have to be able to rationalize it. You don't have to sit and replay the video over and over again. Imagine Paul. Paul is what they think he's dead. Dragged outside the city. The believers start to gather around him. I have a feeling the conversations were like this. Well, that Paul was a good guy, wasn't he? Oh, yeah, it was amazing how God used him. Yeah, wasn't it amazing? Then Paul just gets up and they're like, oh. And then Paul says, I'm going back into town. What? Paul was a little crazy. Now, I'm not saying you have to go back to those friends, but you need to keep going. That's what Paul and Barnabas did. They just kept going. Sometimes in life, all you can do is keep going when things go wrong. Listen to this. Find strength in the Lord and others. Those Christians gathered around Paul. Listen, sometimes when you feel half dead, the best thing you can do is get a few friends and say, would you pray for me? Just send them a text. Pray for me. I'm having a hard day. Pray for me. I don't know anybody who would send you a nope. Eric, would you pray for me? Nope. Too busy. No. No. You send up those arrow prayers. You ask that friend, hey, would you pray for me? Would you lift me up? I'm struggling right now. Sometimes you need those people to gather around you to walk you through. Number three. Oh, let me read this to you real quick because I love this. This is Mother Teresa's Anyway poem. Have you ever heard this? It was from Kent Keith, and then she adapted the ending, which I actually like her version better. People are often unreasonable, illogical, and self-centered. Forgive them anyway. If you're kind, people may accuse you of selfish ulterior motives. Be kind anyway. If you're successful, you'll win some false friends and some true enemies. Succeed anyway. If you're honest and frank, people may cheat you. Be honest and frank anyway. What you spend years building, someone could destroy overnight. Build anyway. If you find serenity and happiness, they may be jealous. Be happy anyway. The good you do today, people will often forget tomorrow. Do good anyway. Give the world your best you have, and it may never be enough. Give the world the best you've got anyway. You see, in the final analysis, it's between you and your God. It was never between you and them anyway. Number three, the most painful, when loved ones die. Unless the rapture happens, none of us will get out of here alive. One of my favorite authors has a countdown clock. My wife says that is the weirdest thing, to which I say, I want one. He figured out what the average age uh, uh, that Americans live, and he got a clock and put his age in and subtracted it, and has a clock that counts down every day. He's one day closer to dying. That is so weird but a great reminder that the truth for all of us is life is short and life is precious. Don't make the loss of a friend or the loss of a relative make you withdraw. Instead, make it make you realize that every day is precious, not just for you, but for others. So show them that. Encourage them on the journey. Walk them through it. The last time David sees his best friend, his best friend says, you're going to be on the throne and I'm going to be right next to you. But then Saul and his son Jonathan die. And David writes this in 2 Samuel 1. David took up this lament concerning Saul and his son Jonathan and he ordered that the people of Judah be taught this lament of the bow. It is written in the book of Jashar. Saul and Jonathan, in life they were loved and admired, and in death they were not parted. Now, I probably would have said, Saul, thankfully, was not a good spear thrower. But David didn't say that. 
He remembered the good things. By the way, every once in a while somebody says, I feel like I'm lying at somebody's funeral. Hey, live your life in such a way that the pastor doesn't have to make stuff up at your funeral. David says, they were swifter than eagles, they were stronger than lions. Daughters of Israel, weep for Saul who clothed you in scarlet and finery, who adorned your garments with ornaments of gold. Do you know what David recognized? David couldn't be king without the death of the last king. There are things in your life that you can accomplish when you lose something or someone. I'm not saying death is fair. This life is not fair. But when you lose somebody that you love, don't let it stop you from going forward. Instead, make it demonstrate to you that every day is precious. And so you have today to let people know that you love them and care about them. To love God and love people, the two commands we should carry out every day. 1 Thessalonians 4.13 says... Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. Listen, we have hope. When we lose somebody, yesterday I did a funeral for a 99-year-old woman. Whether we live to 9 or 99, if we love Christ, if we surrender our lives to Him, the Bible says that we immediately close our eyes here. And just like Jesus said to the thief on the cross, today you'll be with me in paradise. We open our eyes in heaven. But in this world, we get discouraged, we get down. I want to encourage you the last thing, grieve. But remember hope and remember the blessings you have. It's okay to grieve. It's okay to be sad. It's okay to be happy. It's okay to remember stories. It's okay to miss somebody. But don't let it stop you. Keep Moving forward in 1492, as Columbus came this way, he got stopped in the Sargasso Sea because the wind kept blowing. All that brown stuff on the beach, called sargasm now, that's what was all around them. They thought that the sargasm was going to suck their ship down. And so the men said, let's kill Columbus and head home. And Columbus said, uh, let's start rowing. The men started rowing and instantly they started feeling better. And of course, it wasn't long before they found the trade winds again. And whether it's a good or bad ending to the story, you get to decide. But they kept on coming and we're here today. The truth for each of us is it's easy to want to stop. And it's easy to get to a point in life where we have a hard time going forward. But I remember that whole year after my Dad died. My mom over and over said to each of the kids, just keep going. Just keep going. Just take the next step. I don't know what your next step is. And I know when you think 10 steps down the road or 20 steps down the road, it can seem like way too much. But I want to encourage you, just say, God, would you help me to take the next step? Because here's what I know about next steps. Sometimes... Before the next step, you're discouraged. And sometimes after you take the next step, you find courage. So I want to encourage you, just take the next step. God, what do you want me to do next? And then just do it. Every day love, every day encourage, every day surrender your request to God. And let him know, God, I need your help today. I surrender to you. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, I'll be here after the service. And you can say, Eric, I want to give my life to Christ today. And I'd love to talk to you about what it means to surrender to him, knowing that Jesus died and rose again to pay for your sins and my sins. We're all messed up. Maybe you're here today and you struggle with one of these things. Hey, it's okay. Welcome to humanity. Aren't you glad you don't have the bucket? Whatever God has allowed in your life, he will give you the grace to become better instead of bitter. And that's my prayer for you. Let's close in prayer today. Father, thank you for these moments today. I thank you for the life of David. I thank you, Lord, for in your word, us seeing example after example of how, even in the most difficult times, you walked people through. And Lord, you're going to walk those through who are here today. Father, for that one today who's struggling, who's dealing with a heavy crisis, I pray that they right now would know your presence. And Lord, that you'd give them strength, not for weeks, but just for the next step. 
Lord, for that one today who's struggling with a huge event, I pray they today would know that you're going to give them the strength to walk through. Thank you for this time today. In Jesus' name, amen.